Hello, everyone. Welcome to Measuring the Score podcast, the podcast where we offer our opinions on film scores and the films they're inspired by. I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 11 of Measuring the Score podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Inception by Hans Zimmer. But before we begin, Leslie, have you been listening to anything other than what we're going to be talking about today? Yes, I have. Okay. I, are you surprised? Actually, I am. Because <laughs> normally when we come to this, it's, have you been listening to anything? No. <laughs> but, uh, Look, I stay busy. <laughs> And my ears do not stay listening to the music. But they should. <laughs> oh, you're not funny. <laughs> All right. So what have you been listening to? Um, Cowboys versus Aliens. Oh, the uh, um, John Favreau movie. Yes. Ah, uh-huh, that was uh, Harry Gregson Williams. Yes. Which is actually, um, he actually is from Hans Zimmer's little camp, uh, Remote Control Production. That I did not know. Yeah. Uh, he kind of broke off and started doing his own thing, which... He he always had a unique sound to him, and I, I've always well, enjoyed it. Well, this has been a unique score, but it was a unique movie, you know, because you've got this Western element, and then they add aliens. I, I love that movie back in the day. <laughs> I, 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 the only thing I do remember about the score was that it didn't really have, like, a, a theme, a standout theme, to me, anyways. I think, yeah. I didn't finish listening to the score, but... The first part that I listened to, it did sound like they had, maybe the theme came in like that first piece. Right. And then I don't recall hearing it through the pieces that I've listened to. Has it been revisited, you know? Right. Because sometimes they revisit the theme or they rewrite it or they, you know, change the tempo. I I don't recall, but then again, I was also driving in the car. Right. So, you know, I was half paying attention (laughs) to the background music. Well, I've been listening to the Tremors Complete original score. It came in from La La Land Records. Yes, I ordered for you. Yes, as I was about to say, but you kind of just ruined it. But anyway. I ruined your moment. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I've been you know, very excited about this because for so long, I didn't know that um, it was a score by two different composers. I thought the entire time it was scored by Ernest Troost, but it was actually, you know, he wrote a big part of the score, but the producers wanted him to go back and redo the score, but he couldn't. He was already working on another film. So they got Robert Falk, the the guy from the Police Academy movies, to come in and redo the score. (laughs) And, and, you know, it's such a big contrast, but when you watch the film, you can kind of, I mean, it's crazy, but... We're going to cover that score in season two. We've already talked about it, and I was very excited to get the soundtrack. Let me yeah, just say you know that. how I know you were excited? How's that? I checked it. They hadn't shipped it yet. I checked the status. It hadn't been shipped yet. <laughs> when are they going to ship this? They hadn't been shipped yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was, hey, I mean, come on. I was excited. Day four. Man, I wish they would just ship this already. <laughs> Says it's processed. Why hasn't it shipped yet? It was taking a while. <laughs> but you got it. Yes. <laughs> but today we're going to be talking about Inception. Now, Inception uh, was a, such a unique movie when it came out. I liked Inception. I thought it was fascinating. The concept of dream hijacking. Um, I remember that when it came out, I had to sit down and watch it twice in order to understand what was going on the first time i watched it i missed some you know some parts i remember i had to rewatch some parts right um because it's a complex movie it came out in 2010 it was directed by christopher nolan starring leonardo dicaprio tom hardy joseph gordon levitt uh ellen page who is now known as elliot page uh, God, who else? Tom Berenger. Watanabe. I mean, Ken Watanabe. Killian Murphy. Yes, Killian. Uh, and Marion um, 
Cotillard, I cannot pronounce her last name, but uh, she's a French actress, very talented French actress. And when the film came out, it was, I mean, when they announced it, there was no plot details, no nothing. They just had the weird trailer. It was the city folding in on itself. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And everybody's going, what is this movie? What is it about? And then when it was finally revealed that it was talking about dreams, about people going into dreams, dreams within a dream and you know hijacking memories hijacking memories hijacking you know planting ideas into people's minds to you know try to get them to do something else it was like wait what is this the craziest thing ever christopher nolan uh worked on that script for nine to ten years or the concept and uh wait nine to ten years yeah because when he first came up with the idea um, he felt like he wasn't ready to put something like that on the big screen. So in the meantime, after he, you know, I think the original idea was 80 pages. And after Ooh. he completed it, um, he went on to work uh, on Batman Begins, The Prestige, and The Dark Knight. So he did all of those movies before, even though Inception was already written in a rough draft form. He did all those movies before because he felt like he needed more time and experience in order to get it right well, i mean it's such a complex idea and a complex movie and plot and storyline and everything else so yeah i i mean i was kind of surprised what you said nine to ten years but at the same time it's like yeah it, it was needed well and he said that you know he wanted to work with uh, leonardo dicaprio and he was kind of excited about it um wanted to work with him for years and so when he presented uh inception to leonardo dicaprio he was intrigued dicaprio rather was intrigued by the idea of a uh, dream heist notion. So he, he readily signed on. So that was his, you know, opportunity to work with DiCaprio. And he was excited about it. And up until that, up until this movie, I was not a huge, you know, DiCaprio fan. I mean, I saw him in Titanic. He was oh, good. Oh, come on now. It's all of us, you know, kids, because he was <laughs> about our age. So, you know. We watched him, and we were just swooning over DiCaprio. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the the girls were. I wasn't. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. It was just, I always he always had the, you know, stigma of, oh, it's the Titanic boy, you know, whatever. And I just, I was never a huge fan of his up until really this movie here. You didn't I mean, like him in Gilbert Grape? I mean, <laughs> he he was, he was. He played a really good part in that movie, but I mean, eh. <laughs> eh. I mean, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Did you watch that one? I didn't really like the movie too much. <laughs> I, eh. I just didn't. I mean, it was eh. <laughs> and so when I saw Inception, I saw Leo was involved with it. It's a I'm heart going, throb. He was. I'm like, oh man, I don't know. You know, it's got DiCaprio in there, but it, it, well, watching the film, he, he's such a, a very erratic person, and he he's on the verge of losing his mind. You know. And watching the film, which we'll get into the film, you know, after we talk about the score, but watching the film, it made me wonder if DiCaprio was a method actor. I'm uh, just sure. because of the intensity that he had in the film. And I'm like, and I sat there like half the movie and I'm like, I wonder if he's a method actor. <laughs> I wonder if he the, really, you know. The one thing that really caught me, though, watching the film was he his his character really made me think of uh, Kiefer Sutherland's character in Flatliners, how he's just. On the verge of just losing it. I never it. watched Flatliners. It was, it, you'll have to watch it one day. I mean, it, and it really is the the they kind of share the same similarity. They're they're on the verge of losing it. They're they're stressed to the point of almost madness. And I, I when I saw the film, I was like, hey, you know, I really like his you know character. I like this. And then after that, it was all the other films I started seeing him in, you know, Django Unchained, and then, you know. Oh, man, he played a very interesting role yeah, in Django. Yeah, but it was it was very intense, and I, I liked it. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I, I loved his character. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> and, you know, that, that became one of my favorite Tarantino movies was that one, all because of uh, DiCaprio's performance. And so he, he's become... <laughs> Uh, what was the other movie? The one he won an Academy Award for? Um, Reverent. Yeah, Reverent. And that, the Revenant. The Revenant. We we probably saying the wrong movie, but it it was the one he won an Academy Award for. About the attack. Yeah, the it was about attack. the about the bear attack. And again, that had Tom Hardy in it. I think so. And I I 
That was an intense movie. I felt uh, stressed. You know, there's a few movies that I've watched ever, and I felt stressed throughout the whole movie. And that one was one of them. Uh, Harry Potter, the one with um, what's her face in it? You mean Umbridge? Yes, that one. That one made me feel like <laughs> I watched that in the theater, and I felt stressed out like throughout the whole movie. And then the the um, I'm sorry, guys. I really don't watch much TV. Uh, the the space movie that had uh, she was out in space floating around. Oh, 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 gravity. Gravity. Sandra oh Bullock. my goodness. Yeah, that is the one movie that I still cannot go back and watch. And, I, that made me so stressed out. Fantastic score. We may have to cover that one day. Um, but yeah, it was it was the Revenant with a uh, DiCaprio. See, I I reverence Revenants. You know, they we sound the same. We were close. <laughs> um, listening to the score for this, it immediately starts up with um the track "Half Remembered Dream," and it you you hear like a slight piano, a little bit of sound pad coming in there. And then the low brass comes in. You know, the two notes, you know, bom, bom, slowly coming in, coming to the forefront, and just loud as on the what. When I first heard this score, I knew it was kind of crazy that you would hear the loud, the low brass in the forefront like this. Well. Especially at that time in 2010. I when mean, I... I listened to the score. I didn't realize a how short it was. To me, it seemed kind of short for a, you know a movie score. I started listening to it, and then by the time I got to almost the end, I looked down and I'm like, "Oh, it's almost done with." Um, I loved the first three tracks when I initially listened to it. Um, I, my favorite out of the first three tracks was "The Dream Is Collapsing." Right. Um, I love that piece. I think that was is either the third or fourth piece in the score. Um, and the dream is collapsing. It starts off softly with it sounded like guitars to me, um, and then it adds the strings. You can hear them like pianima, pian, pianissimo. <laughs> I can't talk today. Very softly in the background, um, and then they start adding these layers, and these are complex layers. So this melody starts to build. You're motif uh i didn't really hear a motif in there other than these layers of melodies and counter melodies and it starts to build and build and build and then it grows into just this sound where it's kind of chimey before the end and it, then you have the climatic you know conclusion of that piece close to the end um it's very complex and it does build tension and i found the piece interesting i i liked it uh, upon you know listening to it initially um, and, uh, I love that the way that it just sounded together and it, it's completeness. And then after that, the score kind of got boring to me, but then again, I was also driving, but it was, it, it didn't have, it didn't capture my interest like that, that piece there did. Now you were talking about the guitar. That was actually Johnny Marr from the eighties rock band, the Smiths. Oh, yeah. So, and I, I couldn't find the article again, but I remember Zimmer talking about that he had this theme in his head and he wanted Johnny Marr to play it. And he said if Johnny could not do it, then he was going to scrap the entire theme. And he told Nolan he's, he would just have to come out with something else. And now Marr spent four 12-hour days working on the score with Zimmer playing on a 12-string guitar. Oh, that's pretty complicated. Right. I can't even, well, you granted, I don't play stringed instruments. I'm a flautist, first and foremost. So, um, But 12 strings, yeah, that's kind of, to me, complicated. Now, it may not be to my string players out there, but to me, right. it, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, to me, it sounds complicated. I can't even do a regular guitar. So, I mean, I can do piano. I can't do a regular guitar. I've made my uh, cigar box guitar. I can kind of strum around with that. But that's, that's like, like four strings. Yeah, four strings. <laughs> yeah. See, I can't even do that. But no, and, and you're talking about the score. That that was one of the things that really took me back when you told me that I listened to the score and I thought it was kind of eh. And I was like, what? That's my initial impression. Her, the initial impression for her was it was kind of eh to her. And that really blew my mind because i was like i'm like you the dream is collapsing that was one of my favorite pieces listening to the score i mean because i've had this this score 
since the film came out because it was the one thing that really stood out to me was the score. Yeah, when I, I, the film. I really like that piece. And then the rest of it kind of just to me it was like background noise and what I mean by background noise I don't mean anything disrespectful but I, I mean that it was not interesting enough for me to take note um, I do like complex rhythm and melody and some of that to me didn't seem kind of complex no and, and upon first listening to it well and that was that was me and um, but I don't know I still found the score interesting now Used to, I, I wouldn't play the entire score. I would only play, you know, the Dream is Collapsing, and then I think it's... Um, dream See, would, you didn't dream, play the entire score. Dream within the dream. But I did listen to it all the way through back in the day. Now, listening to it again, now, you know, several years later, you know, I've had a, a very interesting palette of scores, and I my, you know, choice has changed over the years. I Going back and listening to it now... I liked the softer pieces. It it was very relaxing, very soothing in parts. I think that's what the problem was. It was very soothing, so soothing that I zoned out. <laughs> well, it was soothing to the point where it made me think of a dream. Well, uh, I think that um, uh, you have a point there. Um, then you had, uh, what was that piece? Um, Mabasa? Yeah, yeah. Um, that to me reminded me of a chase scene or a heist when I would first listen to it. Now, granted, remember we listened to the score and then we listened to the score with the movie. So we're just talking right now about listening to the score. And so when I listened to the score piece, Mombasa, that's what it kind of reminded me of. It, it, it had a little bit a higher tempo to it. It Very sounded like electronic. it had a lot of beats to it. Yeah. Um, put me in mind of somebody running something running something change you know chasing somebody uh that was my first thought when i listened to that piece now that was in the middle of the score so you know between yeah the, and there was no build up to that no, score just, piece either it was just bam like, bam yeah interesting note about that score piece right there that was actually now i don't i could not find a a article about it or nothing now in the film drive angry starring nicholas cage it was the 3d southern action movie it, it was not the it was not the greatest movie in the world i mean but there was this one part in the film where um nicholas cage's character is you know he, he's got a second wind he's going in there he's going to save the girl and everything else the mumbasa track comes in there now, Hans Zimmer did not score the film. It was scored by Michael Wanmacher. But when that came in, I'm going, wait a minute, that's, that's Mombasa. I know that track. That's Mombasa. And, but it was named Mass versus Accelerator. I wonder if he well, they, gave credit to... I, I don't know if he gave credit to him or not. I, I'm hoping he did. But that is straight up that track. But it was redone a little bit. Uh, for one thing, it didn't have the electronic bass sounds coming in there that was replaced with guitar i still think that's plagiarism by definition it it, it is so. I, i'm hoping they gave zimmer credit i mean if anybody knows please let us know uh i cannot find any article about it I, I do remember something a while back how it was they were talking about you know how zimmer's work is uh really ripped off a lot and they played that one track right there uh, again, if anybody knows, please, you know, send us an email, contact us on social media or something and let us know because I couldn't find anything about it. I just thought that was really interesting though. But of course the, the original Mombasa track is, you know, from the score inception from, from the score. And it, to me, it's a lot better than what they did in drive angry. Uh, though going back to the whole, it sounds like a dream. You, you take that piece out and it becomes a very soothing score in parts until you get to where the Johnny Marr theme comes into play and everything else. And then the way it ends, you got the song time where it's, you know, Zimmer on a piano playing it and everything else. And I mean, I, to me, the score was fantastic listening to it. I granted we're going to get to it. But just listening to the score itself, I was not impressed. I was not impressed at all. Um, then we started to listen to the score with the movie. And so before we started watching the movie, I did not have very high expectations. I'm sorry, guys. High expectations because I was not too thrilled with the score. 
Um, but as we mentioned when we discussed the movie, the movie is complex. It talks about dreams and it talks about layers in your dreams. So each layer that you go down in the dream in the movie, you go further into somebody's subconscious. Well, Zimmer is very intelligent. He is an intelligent man. And this was a very intelligent score. So when you listen to the score with the movie, you start to notice that the slower the cues he plays in his score, the deeper he is in the dream. And so as the levels of the dreams change, the slower the score becomes. Which you don't pick up on no. when you listen to the score by itself. Now, there is a song in the film that Nolan wrote into the score. And that is the... Now, I'm going to preface this. <laughs> I'm a Southern woman. I lived in Germany. We talked about I know German. I'm not really good at French. I apologize to my Cajun <laughs> buddies all the time because I butcher their names because they're French. So, if I butcher the name of the song, I apologize. But I have tried real hard. You can ask Chris. I have recited it more than once to see if I could get it right <laughs> because I do like to try to be proper. But the name, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up. You got this. The name of the song is Zunu Regret Ria. Oh, that, was, that, was, that was good. And it's by Edith, Edith Piaf. Now, Nolan wrote this into the score, but he almost took it out when uh, Marion was cast because she had just completed an Oscar-winning turn as Piaf in the 2007 film. Oh, Lord, I'm fixing to butcher this. La Vie en Rose. I don't think that's how that's pronounced. Probably not. <laughs> that's how I'm saying it. But Zimmer, Zimmer's the one that convinced Nolan to do it. He, so, he, this there, is, and Here's the reason why. This is why we have mentioned this. And when I found this out... And after I started to make sense of the score, I'm just like, oh, my God. And it's because all music in the score is the subdivision or multiplication of the tempo of the Piaf music. The Zunu Regretria. When I found this out, everything clicked and I had a completely different meaning for this score. I mean, because it, it, it makes sense, too, because there was a YouTube video explaining uh, the half remember dream and the two brass, the low brass notes. That is basically the beginning of, you know, regret. <laughs> and Piaf's. Uh, yeah, Piaf's score. I mean, uh, a song. And Zimmer uh, actually quoted said, I can't believe him took, a, this, took everybody this long. Well, this is the thing. <laughs> what he did was he took those two prominent uh, notes of that song and he slowed the tempo down. So instead of getting the fast-paced piece that that song was, you got that dun, 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 dun. How, and if you slow the piece down, you can hear that it's just those two notes. And so he wrote that into the score. So anytime you heard that cue, you knew that maybe it was either time for them to wake up because the way that the, the movie was written, that piece would play when it was time for them to wake up. And it, actually, when you listen to the score on its own, there was like a one track. Now, this is a, a soundtrack that's like on Spotify. It was the commercially available soundtrack. You actually heard that song in like one, one piece. And when you heard it, the tempo changed and everything else. And another thing, too. All right. You said that Zimmer would slow the piece down, you know. As or, you went deeper into the dream. As you went so deeper into the dream. So as the levels the went deeper, you would hear the music kind of slow down. And see, that was, that was interesting because after you said that, like later on in the film, toward the end, actually, where Tom Hardy's character Eames is in the snow-covered base and they're, you know, got all this craziness going on. He hears the music. And that's when you would hear the, wham, 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 wham. I mean, that was just. He slowed it down. When, after I, you can ask Leslie, I was completely mind blown when she told me this. I mean, like the next day after she told me, I was still going, I can't get over that. And because you know, the entire, if you, once you, you know, put that into your head and you listen to the score, 
every single score piece in there has that feeling d- that feeling of that song. So at this point, that's when the score got interesting to me because then at that point I took a boring score by itself that didn't sound very good in my opinion by itself and then when you put it with the movie then all of a sudden you've got now this interesting score that was intellectually done. There was intellect behind it. It was strategically done and it so I started to actually look at the pieces a little bit more and I'm just like oh my goodness I cannot believe I didn't see this before well I didn't either and you know I was a a lot bigger fan of the score than you were you know the beginning and I mean it was such a shame that this score did not win an Academy Award I mean it was nominated and after this score came out, there was so many people who tried to copy what he did for this. And it was like, you, you can't. There's no way you can copy what he did for the score. Because it really is one of a kind. So it really, is, and it really is very original, too. There is a, uh, a scene in which uh, Elliot Page is learning that he is within the dream. Um, it's when they were training him uh, to be the architect. And it was that instant in the movie that I actually heard that uh, the um, the half remembered dream piece overlapping with the the uh, Piaf piece, I could hear it overlap into and it overlapped nicely. Uh, So it didn't it wasn't contrasted. Uh, It didn't uh, didn't remind me of two magnets, you know, uh, right? You know, repelling each other. It fit nicely, and it fit nicely because they're the same notes. Well, and it and it worked so well it did. too. I, I I'm still having a hard time trying to believe this. And and the thing was that the score was being written the same time they were filming, so it was kind of a parallel, right? If I'm yes, understanding correctly. Yes. And so then, you know, I just mentioned at the beginning of the podcast about the dream is collapsing and how in my uh, initial uh, impression of the song in which she starts adding these complex layers of these different melodies. And he did that because of the complex layers of the dream. Right. And, And it's so crazy, too, because the score matches the film so perfectly. It was... When I found that out, it was kind of, an, again, another mind-blowing moment because it's, it, it was almost goes back to when we talked about Ennio Morricone and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, it, how that score was written before the film. Yeah, and there was mention that the score was uh, was done simultaneously as the film was being, right. yeah, as the film was being made. Right, so. and and like the, you know, you got the guitar reference, Zimmer said that was a Ennio, Ennio Morricone reference in there with having Johnny Marr play the guitar theme. So, and it's got all these different parallels. And then you get a different parallel. The the scene where, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but this is just my interpretation of, and we both kind of agree on it. The scene where we go into Dom uh, Cobb's uh, subconscious and you're seeing the whole scene with his wife and the hotel is all disarray and everything else and the wife the projection of the wife is there and she's kind of uh evilish a little bit and you said it first and then that's when it clicked to me it was very reminiscent of the shining there was a cue that was played there and it sounded like the first few notes of the theme to the shining and when I heard that, I'm like, oh, my goodness, this sounds like The Shining to me. And it, it makes sense if that was the case, if that was intentionally put in there because of Kerbeck. Um, Kubrick. 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 <laughs> because of his uh, interpretation of um, Torrance's Descent into Madness. Right. And Which could be Cobb's Descent into, into Madness. Madness. And so I, I kind of saw some parallelism there. You know, granted, it maybe I'm reading into it a little too much. But Chris and I, um, after we heard that, we're like, oh, yeah, because you've got this hotel scene. And, got- and then the low brass, like in The Shining, it, it really made me think of The Shining after you said that. It I'm made like, me you think know, of you, The Shining, yeah, too. Yeah, I was like, you know what? You kind of got a point there. And so... Another thing I noticed too that there were a lot of changes from the all the music that's in the film compared to what's available on the soundtrack. 
there was a lot of really great pieces that were not on the soundtrack. There were some that, cues. I, I also noticed that that were not in the the score that we listened to on Spotify. I don't know if that's intentional. I don't know if they added that after the fact. I even looked on YouTube. I could not find like a complete score because usually you can do that. Sometimes they'll have like the I call it the retail version as compared to the complete version, like with like I was talking about with Tremors earlier. <laughs> the nine ninety nine version versus the twenty nine ninety nine version. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and I, I couldn't find like a complete version. Maybe I was just, you know, typing in the wrong search cues or whatever. Uh but like the the toward the end, it's the dream is collapsing theme, but it's there's so many different variations on there. It was like that that was actually kind of nice. I kind of wish those really good you know really great pieces were on the soundtrack filler pieces i think that they they added to the continuity of the of the score um and then i noticed when we got to the um mombasa piece that it fit nicely it was a chase scene you know they they were running and they were um doing a lot of uh not heist but they were they were running i can't remember what they were running from uh, Cobb was running from the organization that he bossed the job with. Oh, that's they were, it. Yeah, they were coming after him. They, they were going to kill him or whatever. And I, I remember that scene, too, because the one thing that really stood out was when he got stuck in the wall. And, oh, yeah. And that's something you don't really see in a movie. You don't, and he was just... And you could tell he was really stuck in there. So it was, it, it was kind of watching... The, it was that moment, like we were talking about with gravity. It was that moment where it's just like... It was very tense, and I'm watching it going... Ugh. You know, please get out, please get out, please get out. And then finally he does. And the music was really reflecting that, And the too. music reflected that nicely. So, um, you know, I, I was glad I kind of picked up on that when I listened to the score initially. Um, so, it it just was a nice flow to me. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And and when you say a nice flow, it, it was almost like the heartbeat of the film. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, a score is supposed to do that. It is supposed to be the heartbeat of the film, but this one really, really drove. The well, if film. you look at the Back to the Future score, and that was another you know movie that kind of dealt with time. And right. granted, this one deals with dreams, but there is a continuity there um, because you're talking about the subconscious and you, you're talking about time. Um, but if you listen to the Back to the Future score, which we mentioned was at episode two, on episode two. Um, you know, he, he made the score where it, it, it kind of reflected the the timeline and the clock and the time scale, that sort of thing. Well, you know, Zimmer in this instance made the score where it kind of reflected the layers of the subconscious. Right. So it, to me, it kind of put me in mind of that second review that we did with Back to the Future and how, you know, he, he made the score sound kind of linear added that time element and then Zimmer, you know, made his score sound um reminiscent of dreams. The subconscious. Right. And and so you're talking about time. Now the in with Interstellar, that was another Nolan film and Zimmer collaboration, uh, Nolan came to him and said that time is the one, you know, inspiration for that score. And that that is another interesting one we we might have to do for the podcast. But uh, I mean, the whole just taking apart that one song and just making it the base for the entire score and missing it in with a very dream esque score is brilliant. I mean, I cannot get a, I cannot just tell you how brilliant that is, and. Again, it is such a shame that he did not win an Academy Award for this, especially. For, I agree. For After the, listening I, to it and watching it with the movie, and you know, as I mentioned, that um, you know, listening to it by itself, I felt like it didn't do its job. But then when I listened to it with the movie, I'm like, oh my goodness, my mind has been blown. Yeah, I mean, and and Zimmer is a very creative person i mean he pretty I think his much dad was is. an engineer all right his dad was an engineer he makes his own instruments and he pretty much was the um uh, uh, godfather of scoring with a computer yeah he used to take his computer's part and make the sounds that he wanted um he tinkered with all of that and so i mean if it was not for zimmer i wouldn't have a job <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and I, I loved how the film just com- immediately opened up with music. I mean, it was the half-remembered dream. Which is 
what we've discussed. We've right. noticed that films that open up with music, it seems like they are the best film. I, I completely agree because uh, you just talked about the Back to the Future. That one did not open up with music, and it was kind of lackluster up until the very end. Up until the very end, and then with this, it opened up with the music, and it made the film. It, it I, I think what it is when you open up on a film with music, you automatically get the feel of the movie. You get, you get the, the soul, you get right. the emotion, and you get deep into the storyline. I agree. No, I, I totally agree with that. So, I I think I'm making a staple right here, right now. 90% of the time, when a score when a film opens up with the score, it's immediately going to have, it's going to immediately engross you into the score. Now watch our next film. review, we're like, oh, we were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be surprised if that happened. No Knowing our luck. <laughs> oh, we're wrong. So, as always with these score, with the podcast, we... Once we're through talking about them and everything else, we ask three simple questions. Does it work for the film? Absolutely. I think it does. I, truthfully, I could not see this film without the score. I could not either because it's so interwoven into the storyline itself. Um, it, to change the score, you'd have to change the storyline of the movie. Because Zimmer, I mean, Zimmer, when Zimmer read the script, he said immediately, he's like, I get the story. I get it. Maybe that uh, that makes me crazy, or you know something. It was something to that extent. And he's like, "But yeah, I I like the story. I got it." And since he was involved in it with that very early of a process, maybe that's what helped him with it. I mean, well, it obviously did. Uh, so yes, does it work for the film? Absolutely. And I agree too, a hundred percent. Uh, now, what is your favorite scene or score from the film? So. Granted, you know, we discussed just a, a few minutes ago about um, the uh, dream is collapsing. I love that piece. That was my Which favorite I, piece. I consider that basically the theme for the film. That was my favorite piece. But my favorite scene of the movie was actually when they were fighting in the hallway and the hallway was twisting. I really liked that scene. Yeah, that one was pretty crazy. I mean, because they had uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt basically tumble around like a hamster. Yeah, and he said that <laughs> he said that uh, when they were practicing for that uh, scene, he just practiced, you know, six days a week. He said, and if you didn't get it right, you know, you were falling over light fixtures. He said he was just constantly getting beat up trying to get it right. And um, uh, Nolan was trying to use as many practical effects as he could. And I noticed that was the first thing I noticed. And you remember I told you I said, mm -hmm. "Hey, geez, these effects have lasted." Uh, a lot better than the mummy, for example, <laughs> and uh, they have because ninety percent of them were practical. Pra practical, yeah, and that, and that was really cool too because you could see that, like when Killy Murphy's sitting there talking, and you see the glass start tilting with the water in there, and you see the water hitting, you know, the the rain hitting the the windows and stuff, where DiCaprio's drawing his attention to the dream that he's inside. I thought that was great. So yeah, I I. 100% happy that Nolan stuck with practical effects. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practical gal. You know, maybe we'll talk about practical facts if we ever have a bonus episode about how they used to do it when it was a black and white film. Um, but I'm all for practicality. And if you can put a practical effect in there, that makes me a happy gal. <laughs> now, one of my favorite <laughs> scenes is, um, I, I mean, I, I like the whole hallway fighting scene, but I think the montage scene where they're, Coming up with the plan, they're they're brainstorming. They're brainstorming how they're going to do this and everything else. And you get one of the uh, funnier lines where Saito's character, uh, the character Saito, is they're talking about okay, they're like, all right, so we're going to have to buy out the the flight attendants and everything else. And Saito just comes in. I bought the airline. It seemed needed at the moment. I mean, that was just great. Uh, another one of my favorite scenes is when. Tom Hardy's character Eames, uh, Joseph, they're in a, a gunfight, and Joseph Gordon Levitt's got like this one gun. He's shooting at him. All of a sudden, Eames comes around. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. And he shoots off a big, you know, 
grenade launcher at this one guy. <laughs> I love that part. You know, the, the irony behind it is that it's such a delicate line. And it, it was a very sensitive, delicate phrase he used there when he called him darling. Right. And then all of a sudden he pulls out this big gun <laughs> that was really masculine <laughs> and blast it, to, you know, and it just... The balance there was just was like that's amazing. It just and it was that line. one scene right there that really got Tom Hardy noticed because that's when people were like, "This guy's pretty good. Let's let's hire from him for this." I like him as an actor. He's a good actor. He's a fantastic actor. He really is. They all were really good actors in this film. I, you know, granted we don't critique on that basis since this is a, a, a you know a podcast about music, but. Um, the, to me, the acting was solid in the movie. I liked it. And that's one thing I've noticed about Nolan. He he will hire uh, actors who are either from TV or they're kind of faded in the, into obscurity, like having Tom Berenger come in and playing. A, yeah, you haven't a, seen a, him act in a while before right. that. Right, and even, even back then when this film came out in 2010 and uh, Batman Begins, he had Rudger Hauer, who was really doing a lot of lower-budgeted films. In Interstellar, he's got the one um, one actor that was from the show Scorpion. Uh, he played the uh, Walter. He played the the lead character on that show. I mean, it was a TV show. You're gonna have to remind me what Interstellar is about. Uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey um, goes into space, and he ends up coming back into the past. Uh, we'll have to watch it. It was one of I don't the, remember. It was one of those really confusing ones. Oh, maybe that's why I don't remember it. <laughs> uh, we'll have to go back and watch it because I can just completely butcher that. When you plot. said Matthew McConaughey in space, I'm like, yeah, I don't remember that one. I remember him in Daisy Confused. No, no, this one's <laughs> completely different than that. Uh, one of my favorite score pieces for this film, though, was um, One Simple Idea. And it, it may be the score piece that's coming, uh, that's playing over the montage scene, but for like the longest time it used to be the dream is collapsing i mean that would be like the one piece i would listen to over and over but one simple idea after listening to it again recently for this podcast i was like you know you what? hear I, it differently i hear it differently and i i really enjoyed listening you to know that and piece. i that's one thing that i've noticed about this exercise that chris and i've been doing granted you know we've always had a love for music score and we've all had a love for movies but sitting down here uh every week and listening to the score and then the score versus the film makes us, or I, I don't know about you, I'm speaking for you, but it, it makes me listen and watch the movie just a little bit differently now. Oh, no, definitely. It really does. Because uh, for you, it was Back to the Future. For me, it was... Child's Play. It was Child's Play. And, and you know, going back and listening to these and looking at them from a different perspective really throws you for a loop well even when we look, went uh we watched wonder woman 1984 here recently and that was the first thing that i picked up on was you know the score um listening to the you know even though i watched the movie i i, I took note a little bit differently on the score than what i would have before right and, and that's that's a, that's a shame too because that was scored by hans zimmer in which we we talked about that and uh don't make me sad Oh, yeah, we, we we talked about that in uh, in another episode. Now, lastly, could anything be changed? I I think not. I don't think not so for either. This movie. No, uh -huh. and, and if you changed anything, Leslie said it best. If you changed anything, you would have to change the story. You have to change the storyline because the score is so embedded within the story. It's it part of the story. It's become one with the story. Right. And the only other instance that we have seen that was when we reviewed the good and bad and the ugly. In my opinion. Yeah. You know, and I agree with you. So, does it work for the film? Yes. Uh, we talked about our favorite scenes and scores, and could anything be changed? No. So, Inception, for us, uh, was a fantastic score. I mean, it was a great film. If you have not seen it, please go out and watch it. You can listen to the score on Spotify, YouTube, wherever you listen to music from. I'm just typing Hans Zimmer. It's going to be listed as one of his, you know, more popular ones. And with good reason. And if you haven't seen Inception, go out and watch it. Um, it's worth it. It's about two hours long, almost. Right. Um, but it's it's worth the it's worth watching it. It's worth it if you had to rent it. It's worth the money. 
I would just uh, preface that you need to pay attention because it does have some deep, confusing parts. It really does. Unless you sit down and really watch and pay attention. <laughs> so, guys, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Um, as always, you can catch us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube. You can send us an email, measuringthescore at gmail.com. Uh, we're usually, you know, the best way to really get a hold of us is either email, Facebook, or Twitter. We're really on those, um, more than others. Uh, you can catch us on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, YouTube, uh, Deezer, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. Radio. <laughs> you owe me a Coke, poke, poke. <laughs> Uh, iHeartRadio, uh, tons of other ones. I believe we're also on Stitcher as well. I just found out about that one. And, I mean, it, pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts, you can find us. And um, am I forgetting anything else? Nope. Oh, uh, our next episode Whoops. is... Yep. <laughs> I did forget something. My bad. Our next episode <laughs> is going to be on Bad Boys, the Will Smith, Martin Lawrence action comedy that was Michael Bay's first film. Oh, I didn't realize that was his first film. Yeah, it was produced by Don Simpson and Jerry Borkheimer. This one's going to be interesting, guys. Yep. And for good reason. So, as always, thank you so much for listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube. I'm Chris Lott. And I'm Leslie Lott. Have a good one. Hey, everyone. Before we completely close this episode out, I want to give a quick shout out to two different podcasts. First off, Josh from Twist My Arm Podcast Network was awesome enough to have us on and interview us to talk about different aspects of the podcast, different things about our life. And we just had a total blast with him that we decided to have him on for season two. That's right. Josh from Twist My Arm will be on for season two. Also want to give a shout out to Mo and Max over at Buzz in the Tower. They were awesome enough to ask us, what is our favorite 80s movie? I mean, that is just insane. So we, we it took a little bit. We were trying to come up with some ideas. I think we come up with some good answers. But seriously, go check out those guys. I mean, they do nothing but 80s movies, 80s trivia, everything. They got a hilarious episode where they recast the Karate Kid. I mean, come on. That's just great. And their logo looks like Top Gun. Seriously, go check out both of those podcasts, Twist My Arm and Buzz in the Tower. Make sure you give them a rate, a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts at. And when you do this, tell them we sent you. So as always, for measuring the score, I'm Chris. Have a good one.